I am delighted to have with me Dr. Gabrielle Matthews, who is an NHS Assembly <laughs> uh, NHS Assembly member and UK Youth Trustee. That's the first time that's happened today. Mm. And Prof Professor Chris Ham, who is also NHS Assembly co-chair. Uh, Gabrielle is an academic foundation doctor in North Central London. Uh, multi-award winning children and young people's health advocate and a long-term patient and the youngest original member of the NHS Assembly and there are, her um, CV goes on and on so I haven't got time to um, tell you the rest but it's brilliant, amazing in fact. Uh, and Chris Ham is exactly the same, his CV is, is lengthy but uh, as I said, co-chair of the NHS Assembly, Emeritus Professor of Health Policy and Management at the University of Birmingham and Senior Visiting Fellow at the King's Fund where he was Chief Executive and can I say was an enormous help to my reporting during COVID and um, actually I think has been an enormous help to my reporting for something like 40 years now. So thank you very much, which has just aged us both considerably. Yeah, no, and I wasn't 10, but you can come back again. Yeah, um, I'm just going to pick up first on on um, with you, Gabrielle. Is um, is this the lived experience, which is which is um, shining through in this, and and how it is helping you both with the NHS assembly and in your job as a doctor? Yeah. So uh, my journey to being a doctor, and it's really cliche to say, I know, but started by being treated by amazing doctors, and I think often at work. Like, it's really easy. As much volunteering advocacy work I've done and heard other stories, the easiest thing to do is to go back to your own experiences and be like, what would I want in this situation? And then to build on how I felt there. So, yeah, day-to-day -day work, it's incredibly helpful because I've had amazing care in the NHS, but I've also had care that hasn't been as good. And I've had the time to think on what that was and where it didn't go quite right. And then in my work on the assembly and elsewhere... I really early on got introduced to amazing youth workers and play therapists and like allied professionals who were hearing from patients and what they wanted to change and got the chance to, in Birmingham Children's Hospital and then in London, look at what that change can look like at a trust level. And I think seeing that so early actually made me believe in a way that I'm, I still hold on to those memories that you can, with a really well built up team that trusts each other, change your local system despite what's going on elsewhere. And I think that's what I hold on to when I, I, I still volunteer in, um, well, mostly in youth work charities now, but in the health sector. And like, I love to bring that to the assembly because it gives me another side. I obviously, I see children in, at work every day. I currently work in A&E, but seeing children not in hospital and what their life is and what's important to them. And then being able to be like, why do we take that away and not hear it in our, in our work? Um, I think makes me a lot better advocate when I'm in places like the Assembly. Uh, Chris, um, do explain for those here who don't understand the NHS Assembly, but can you just broaden it out too? Because you, you, re you produced a report at, at the NHS at 75, and I want to know how much influence that had. Yeah, so thank you, Victoria. Let's have a show of hands, and those Assembly members in the room aren't allowed to vote. Hands up those of you who've heard of the NHS Assembly before coming to this meeting. Goodness me, we have a very well-informed group here. OK, well, don't explain it then. <laughs> so, briefly, the Assembly is made up of about 50 people, set up by NHS England five years ago on the back of the long-term plan for the NHS, if you remember that. Uh, to, as a body uh, to debate and discuss and advise the leadership of NHS England on the implementation of that plan. The key thing to note about the Assembly is the diversity of its membership in all senses of diversity. So uh, we have uh, Jag in the front row and Patricia next to him, who are both Assembly members. Stand up, the two of you, so we know <laughs> who's on the Assembly. Yeah and others who I'm not going to embarrass also with us today. I have to say it's the most fantastic group of people that I've been involved in because of that diversity of views and experience and opinion they're able to bring to bear to our discussions. Diversity in terms of the NHS, people from local government, the voluntary sector, uh, 
patients, people with lived experience, staff at the front line and staff in royal colleges and similar bodies. And we did produce that report last year on the NHS 75. And if you heard Matthew Taylor and his talk an hour or so ago, essentially what Matthew said is what we said from the assembly needed to be at the forefront of the NHS planning and uh, policy for the future. More emphasis on prevention, getting upstream, intervening early, not just through the NHS, but in other ways too. Secondly, more care uh, at home and closer to home, investment in general practices and community services, those integrated neighborhood teams that Claire Fuller's report uh, spoke about. And then thirdly, uh, care centered on the needs of individual patients and communities. Uh, personalization, if you like to put it in that shorthand. So those are the top three priorities for the future, recognizing a huge amount has been achieved in the last 75 years, but boy, there's a mountain to climb as we go forward. I was going to ask you about that. So some of the other stuff that the, uh, that the report talks about is um, the complexity of the processes that are still there, the, um, the need for a thriving workforce, um, better use of technologies and data. Um, leaving aside the, the last one, the thriving workforce, let's go back to that. Tell me about your night last night. Oh, yes. So I um, had the pleasure, I'm currently working in A&E at the moment in North London. Um, because it's a rotor, um, I was working last night into this morning. I finished at six. Um, you wouldn't know, would you? Uh, thank you. Um, so I think there's two sides to the workforce. I think let's do like personal support and then I think systemic. For me as a staff member, as I already said, as a patient, I live with long-term conditions. I am immunosuppressed. So what that means for what I, what I should do in the workplace is that I should have PPE, I should not be with patients that are most infectious, but in a system where I'm, I was the only doctor in the pediatric, like the only a &E doctor in the pediatric a &E last night, if a child comes in with measles, I have to see them and I did see them. It, there's not time for me to go and take a doctor from adults where there, there is like, there was a five hour wait last night to pull them across for my health. And there also isn't that expectation, I think really that I should do that from the, I think if I were to do that, I'd really have to push against people around me. And also, the rotor and shift system, I know we're not going to be able to change that, but it is not a system in which you can rest well or take care of yourself or find time to balance life. And I'm really surprised by how people manage to do that. At a systemic level, and we had a really good conversation about this at the assembly, when I go to take a break at the Whittington A&E, and everyone who's worked there will say this, if you ever meet someone who's worked in Whittington A&E, we have always had mice, and we have now I've got cockroaches, I don't know if that's always, in our break rooms. So I don't go to our break room anymore. I go and I heat up my food there, and then I go and sit in ambulatory care, which they lock overnight, so you can't get into it, but like in the side to take a break. So as good as my team is, and I am, was working with the most amazing doctors last night, if I needed support, I needed it. The environment isn't set up for me to be well rested or to have capacity to ask for people to cover me when I need to for my health. And I would say that I am as close to thriving as I can be in work right now. But a lot of that, I'm confident, is from having the, the opportunity to do things like the assembly and have things outside of work that really nourish me and have mentors that are senior and will support me if I need to ask for other things. And a lot of people at my level, so I'm literally the second year in being a doctor, do not have that kind of support around them. It is disheartening, though, isn't it? I mean, over the years, when you've watched the health system and the, watched the way that it treats its staff and hasn't been very good at necessarily retaining them uh, and, at the moment, in recruiting them, when you hear stories like that, does it, does it make you lose hope? Well, you never lose hope, do you? I think well, you not need, you. No. Yeah, you need realistic optimism, grounded optimism, and I think that's what the Assembly often brings in this discussion, so to take support for staff and recognizing the importance of their health and well-being, because you know, we've known for a long time, if you have happy staff who feel supported and feel valued, that communicates to patients in terms of their experience of care and the outcomes of their care. And if you don't, then it has the reverse effect. So the assembly consistently over five years has kept on going back to 
are we doing enough of the right kinds of things nationally, trust by trust, uh, primary care network by primary care network, to provide the right kind of support, which could be healthcare support through practitioner health, could be some basic hygiene factors like having a room that doesn't have mice and doesn't have cockroaches, could be things like access to food and drink while people are on the night shift. This is not rocket science, Victoria, is it? We've been talking about this for as long as I can remember. And the Assembly will keep on returning to these issues until we are satisfied that those messages have been heard and acted on, that's the key thing, loud and clear at a national level. So the discussion that Gabby just referred to, we were in a room uh, with uh, Navina, who's the head of HR within NHS England, uh, with Chris Hobson, who's with us today, who is a sponsor of the NHS Assembly within NHS England, and their senior colleagues, listening to these diverse voices banging on yet again about things we are improving on, but there's still a long, long way to go. Yeah, I noticed there are no journalists in this assembly. I don't know what's gone wrong there. <laughs> Oh, there is. There is. Oh, there is. Holly, Holly Toynbee. Toynbee. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Oh, well, that's a good one to have. Good. Um, I wanted to come back to a slightly different subject, but it's on the rights and responsibilities of the communities. And I wonder how that voice is being heard in the Assembly and, and how that's being translated. So, one person who does a great job of bringing that voice is Rachel Power from Patients Association. And then Louise, who I also saw somewhere from Health Watch. They do amazing work at hearing from patients and just like peep carers, just a bit, anybody who wants to hear, talk to them, they will listen to about like their relationship with the health system and the care that we give. And we've also got amazing lived experience partners on the assembly who bring their experience. I don't think you can ever hear enough and for all the lived experience members that are there and the Health Watch and um, Patient Association, we're still going to miss voices. And, and like, I think we're really conscious of that. But we've had some good conversations. And I think the reports focus on needing to listen to what patients want, along with this focus on maybe a shift in responsibility or a change in power, comes from those conversations that often we're, no, we're nowhere near giving patients what they're actually addressing, what they're actually worried about. But also... I don't think we're, as a system, very good at saying when people haven't managed things appropriately or where they could have gone elsewhere and kind of giving them those skills. And I think there is a balance to be found. And actually, I think, some of, as amazing as the Assembly is, I think some of these conversations need to happen far, far away in the community with those communities at local level. Like, that was the point of ICBs, to hear, actually, in that local area, why are people not able to get to their GPs or to their pharmacies? Um, but we are trying to have that conversation at the Assembly as well. Do you think it's working? Well, not yet. Um, so uh, my, my take on this is Matthew in his talk mentioned a, a social contract, that's a new social contract, which might set out the rights that people have when they come to access health and care, but also the role they can play, if you like, their responsibilities, the reciprocal relationship between the two. And what the Assembly has said in the NHS 75 report is that should be a higher priority, that we need to recognise the positive contribution everyone can play with the right kind of support. I think both Richard Meddings and Amanda Pritchard spoke today about the NHS app and how slowly but surely that's getting traction. More and more people are using it, accessing their test results, they're making appointments, they're accessing their medical records on their NHS app. Uh, that's belated, but it should be welcomed as a small step to giving people the information literally in their hands that they can use to make informed decisions about their use of health and care and the contribution they can make to staying well, keeping healthy. Again, let's see this in a positive light about the assets of communities, not their deficits. And I think we've been very slow as an NHS to get into that discussion. I mean, it certainly comes up for conversation a lot and has for, for many years, but um, where there is the barrier perhaps as to, well, I, I don't quite understand, it's, it's about lack of education or lack of um, uh, support in the community. I mean, what, what does stop it? Um, from what I, like, just speaking from my experience in A&E, so over this last week, 
a lot of people don't know who to ask. So you, particularly I've seen a lot of, in a &E, a lot of people are very, very unwell and need care, but I've also seen a lot of people who are vomiting and they panic and they don't know who to ask for help and they maybe don't, they live by themselves or they don't have someone to go to and they're scared of being a, at home and they come to hospital because that's somewhere that's safe. So, and I know we've done loads of work on, you can go to your pharmacist, you can call 111, but also people do appropriately call 111, but for children and young people, it often sends them into hospital or sends them an ambulance. So I think people either are really unsure about where to go and they're struggling with their support system around them and they come to where it's safe and they still think the NHS is safe, thankfully, or they seek help where they know it through 111 and they get directed to us again. And I think often we get frustrated in the system of when people direct to acute services, but patients have done entirely the right thing in calling it. I guess we just need to be a bit more confident on how we can improve the advice they're getting so that we're not getting frustrated at them when they end up in hospital because they've been told to turn up to us. But I'm sure, Chris, you can add to that. Well, I think a lot to add to that is that uh if you think about the big drivers of change, the ageing population, the changing disease burden, more and more what presents in general practice in hospitals is people with long-term chronic medical conditions, often more than one. And when you're in that position, I speak as somebody who qualifies in that way, you, know, you learn a lot about what you should and shouldn't do and how you can help yourself to stay well and healthy, the old idea of expert patients. And you know, we were talking about expert patients when I worked in the Department of Health between 2000 and 2004. Uh, these things go in cycles, don't they? We need to bring it back and say, what more could and should we do to inform and support everybody with a long-term condition, to be as knowledgeable as they wish to be, to provide the information at their fingertips, and to help the healthcare teams to treat them as equal partners. I remember visiting a a well-known uh, healthcare system in the States a long time ago, talking 30 years now, and one of their medical leaders said to me, he said, you know, Chris, the most important member of the primary healthcare team is not the family doctor, it's not the nurse, it's the person receiving care, because the decisions each of us makes every minute of every day of every year has a bigger impact on our health and well-being than that very short time we have with the doctor or the nurse. And we are slow to recognize that and then support people to be equal members of the primary health care team. Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to slightly tiptoe through this next question because of the PERDA regulations and the restrictions on charities. But you've got a new health secretary. We know that for sure. We don't know of what you, but what is the most urgent thing you feel they need to put on their plate that will be on their plate? Like the, what issue do I think is most pressing? No I, no, I don't want to give that one. I think what I really want from any new health secretary is to feel like they've, they've genuinely listened and taken time to hear, because loads of the topics that we've spoken about today, like particularly estates or staff support, are the exact same conversations we've had for a really long time. The frustration with a new health secretary is that they come in and they discover staff support as a new issue, or they discover NHS tech as a new issue. I don't want, like I'd actually be more excited if they didn't discover a new most pressing issue. If I, if I really felt that they'd taken the time to listen to the system and to listen to <coughs> Sort of servants that have been waiting there for a long time. So sorry, not very. No, no, <laughs> that's happy. fine. That's fine. What would you say? Well, the urgent one is let's sort out the junior doctors dispute <laughs> and get them back to work with the right kind of deal, which is affordable and appropriate to their needs, because that would make a big difference in my view. I think secondly, doing something serious around what we were discussing just now, Victoria, valuing and supporting our staff because if we don't do that, then nothing can follow on more generally. And I think a lot of what we said from the Assembly in the NHS at 75 report, you know, prevention has been a recurring theme, hasn't it, today? And when I started my career in the mid-1970s, uh, the government of the day, uh, which was a Labour government, published a document called Prevention and Health, Everybody's Business. Uh, and the junior minister responsible for that was an ambitious young medical politician called David Owen. 
and we're still saying the same thing today. So there's a clue there as to what we're not doing that we should be doing a lot more of. Mm. And social care. Indeed. Mm. And I, I half expected you to say something about children and young people's services, yeah. to give more, um, to more emphasis to more, yes. Yeah, I think it's tough. And I, and I definitely think we need that focus. But it's hard when like, the majority of the burden on the system is from, from adults. So I would really love a health secretary who is mindful and like, really aware and conscious of the challenges that children and young people face and why we get it wrong and recognizes. Like, I know Amanda used the story earlier of like, looking into the prams, like, recognizes that opportunity that we can have if we really care for our children and young people. But I also think that paediatrics are doing a really, really amazing job. Like, children and young people's services are doing a really good job. They just need the support to continue doing it and doing it well. And we need to think further about the support that they get beyond our health system. Because most children and young people are well. We just need to help them stay well, eat well, exercise well, have good dental services. Yeah, and that's, like, not something that that health minister can spend all of his time on. It's a small proportion, but just the mindfulness of it, I think. And, uh, agreeing with all of that, I've been looking recently at what the 42 integrated care systems in England have been setting as their priorities. Mm -hmm. And a very common one is giving every child the best possible start in life. Mm -hmm. That first 1,000 days is absolutely crucial, isn't it? So yeah, even if pessimistically, uh, the next health secretary doesn't do that, then positively we've got 42 systems out there saying this really matters for us. That's really interesting. Now, are there any questions? We have, we have time. Uh, there's one up here, um, right at the front, of course. <laughs> Hang on, just wait two ticks. Uh, Jack Tossing, uh, NHS Assembly, two more months as a chair of a NHS Trust, uh, coming to the end of my nine years. Um, I really enjoyed working in the Assembly, but I'd be really interested in what do you think your legacy, Chris and Gabby, has been for the NHS Assembly? I should take that one, shouldn't I? <laughs> so I don't think it's my legacy. I think it's the Assembly's legacy and your legacy too and everybody else who's been uh, involved. Can, can I kind of slightly reframe it around has it had any impact and any influence on anybody at all? So the answer at one level is no, because it was set up as an advisory body, not an executive body with decision-making powers. What I would say is in the last five years, Simon Stevens, when he was the NHS chief executive, came to every meeting. He would speak briefly, and then he would listen to the conversation for the rest of the meeting. And that took up about five hours of his time every meeting. Amanda has done very much the same, as has Richard Meddings. So it's an intangible, but I'd say having those top leaders of the NHS in the room, not speaking most of the time, but listening to that diverse range of voices, they tell me, and Chris Hobson may want to comment on this too, that that has changed their way of thinking about the issues that they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I, like, I think for me personally, that's the way that I like to make a change, is to feel that you get to know someone, work with them, challenge their thinking directly. I think the other thing is there's, there's a privilege in being able to get to know such a diverse group of people and spend time working with them. Like, I've known all these people now for coming up to four years and like able to comfortably challenge but also hear their opinions. And it means I feel like we've been, have, been able to have really, really meaningful conversations about health inequalities and equality, diversion, and inclusion, what that means for our staff who are also like suffering from those health inequalities and for our populations. And for me, that's been really, really powerful. And like core 20 plus five for children, coming out of some of the discussions and the championing that Russell did when he was on the assembly, Russell Viner. Um, I think that and Habib's work with the NHS Race and Health Observatory that to me is a, bit, a really, really big impact because I think you need a really, like, quite a safe space to have those conversations, and I think we've genuinely actually been ha able to have them in quite a challenging way. So talking about a legacy, I mean, it's not stopping, is it? No. <laughs> Good. We thought we'd just make that clear. Yes. Oh, sorry. Should I go next? Yep. No, you go and then Chris. 
So my question is uh, very different. Um, it's about um, engagement with the communities. So I still think as much as we try through Health Watch and all different organisations, the NHS still has a very paternalistic view on yeah. the community's health and what the solutions are. So if I think about the work we've done in my system, what do you think the Assembly can do to encourage NHS England and systems to really get into a partnership of equals with the community and really start to understand the barriers to good health and well-being and co-produce the solutions with communities? Because I, I really believe that the NHS right now is, is heading to a place where it's unaffordable. You know, we can't have a service that spends 40% of the public tax receipt and think that in the next few years that expenditure is going to continue to rise. And I really believe that if we have honest conversations with the communities about where they see the priorities and engage them in those decisions and how the money should be spent, that we will move towards a communities that are more responsible around their own health and that the overall cost of healthcare will start to come down. But we're not having that conversation that's meaningful. And how do you think the Assembly can encourage that as a culture of a way of working? So, so partly I think it's by leading by example on that. So I did mention this around the NHS 75 report. It wasn't a few members of the Assembly sitting in a room writing a report. It was based on extensive engagement and consultation with big organisations, Patient Association, Health Watch, and many more besides, and with lots of individuals who fed in their views. So, for example, when we talk about is now the time to be much more explicit about the social contract, the deal between the public and the NHS. The Assembly can say that at a national level, but the next step is to carry that forward across the 42 integrated care systems and take it forward within the places in those systems. I know you're doing some of that already, Patricia. So I think the Assembly needs to work hand in hand with organisations like yours to make it real. And I think that leading, for example, also means speaking confidently about the leadership that we want across the NHS. And I don't think that if we were going to describe the leadership that we do want across our whole system, that's what we're seeing. And we haven't supported managers and leaders like we want. And, and I think that's where it comes from. We are paternalistic as a system to other parts of the system. Like This paternalism just comes down and then we expect local systems to do amazing engagement work where they co-produce with their community and not be paternalistic. I think that's that's not really possible. So I think if we can be more honest about the culture that we want, one that's psychologically safe for all of our staff, where we're willing to hear dissent, where we're willing to challenge, where we're kind to each other and systemically kind, then that will be a system in which we'll no longer be paternalistic to our communities. But we're just so far from that in a lot of our leadership spaces. And I think the, the Assembly can, can lead on that but, and Amanda did mention it as well, we, like we're going to look more at how we train our managers, but I, I just think it's a much, much bigger conversation about how we support leadership across the system. And, and actually, kind was a word that was throughout the report, actually, mm. uh, which, which a lot of people forget to use yeah. in this instance. Chris. Thank you. Th um, thank you, Victoria. <laughs> I just wanted to really pick up, Chris, you very kindly uh, referenced me. I, you know, I've been in the NHS for 12 years, and the th really interesting thing about the Assembly is that you get a completely unique and different quality of conversation that effectively comes from having service users, those who represent them and are their public voices, frontline members of staff and royal colleges and those who represent frontline members of staff, and then people who are actually leading services in terms of chief execs. Um, and, and what, what I find really interesting about the Assembly is that it's often where you get to hear a real clear consensus across all of those kind of diverse voices that really makes you, and it's often expressed in ways that are actually not ones that we traditionally use when we talk as senior leaders and managers. And 
that's what I think Chris's point about senior leaders inside NHS England taking the time to listen to those diverse voices, identify where there is a kind of clear consensus, I just think is incredibly valuable. So I just did want to say thank you to all of the Assembly members who are in this room for actually helping generate that kind of quality of conversation that genuinely in my 12 years I've not heard or seen anywhere else. Well, that is an incredibly positive way to finish this discussion, and I'm sorry we've run out of time, gone over to... Oh, OK, well, look, if you can just take one more question, can you? Because we were a little late starting. Sorry, I hadn't seen you. Hi, my name's Anthony Sembatia. I work for Northwest London ICB. I'm really pleased to hear about this assembly. I had never heard of it before this time. Uh, we run a new program which is about recruiting refugees into the NHS. As many of you may know or may not know, we've got 200,000 refugees in the NHS, sorry, in the UK, who have a right to work. And of course, you probably know we've got all these difficulties recruiting to various areas within the NHS. So my question is, um, now that I know about the assembly. I want to join the assembly so that we can get those 200,000 or at least 5% of them into the NHS. How can you help? How do I get to the assembly? Thank you. Well, you raised the question about how do we get there in the first place and how do new people come on? So simply, from time to time, people drop out, new people come in. Some people are appointed because they write in and say, I've heard about the assembly. If there is a vacancy, could I be considered? Sometimes we know there is a gap around, say, people with lived or living experience, and then we can reach out to people we know in that category. Sometimes it might be a president of a college is moving on and somebody needs to be appointed to fill that particular slot. So I really encourage you to write in. Uh, right to the Secretariat who are here with us. Ben is sitting in the second row and can let you know the best way of doing that. And anybody else who has an urge to become involved in the Assembly, please make yourselves known to Ben and we can take it up from there. By the way, Victoria, can I just mention uh, my co-chair, Claire Gerarda, has sent her apologies today. She had an urgent personal commitment uh, that came late in the day. Uh, but Claire's played a big part in the work of the Assembly up until now. Yeah. Listen, thank you very much, and I'm sorry for keeping you over time, but that was just too interesting a discussion. Uh, thank you, Gabriella. Thank you, Chris, for your time, and could you please show your appreciation. Thank you.